Grace and peace be with each and every one of you. Welcome to worship here at Covenant Presbyterian. I'm glad you're here on this beautiful October morning as we gather together as God's people. We have a uh, lot, thing, a lot of things happening in the life and ministry of the church. You can check the bulletin announcements or check our website. Um, adult education and mission opportunities, opportunities to donate books for a good cause, all sorts of things coming up. Um, we also have something brand new here at Covenant. Some of you already were in the courtyard in between services today. We've got space heaters out there, these uh, propane heaters to help keep us warm. We can stay outside a little bit longer, um, enjoying that good, fresh, clean air. Um, nice opportunity. Thanks to TJ Sargent and the Deacons for making those happen. This is also the time of year when we're asking members and longtime uh, friends of Covenant to consider a pledge for our operating budget for 2022. Um, our generosity campaign is happening, and we've targeted next Sunday as Generosity Sunday with the hope that pledge cards might be turned in by then. A lot of people have turned them in already. Thank you. Um, we continue to pray for good things to continue happening here at Covenant um, through 2022 and beyond. Today, as we gather for worship, we are um, concluding our series on The Walk, this book that we've been looking at over the last six or so weeks by Adam Hamilton, thinking about what it means to live the Christian life and reflecting on certain practices of the Christian life. I'm really glad Nancy Enderley is here to offer the sermon today. She's a longtime friend of Covenant and served in a variety of roles around here, and she has a, a wonderful sermon for us today. We gather here for worship to reconnect with God, to reconnect with one another, and this is a season when we're really trying to get back on track. It's been a challenging season for our world and for our lives, and a lot of us are having a hard time, and so this idea of utilizing these essential Christian practices, kind of getting back to the basics, remembering who we are and whose we are and God's love for us, um, it's the hope that we'll get back on track and one step at a time continue the walk of faith, the journey of faith. So with that hope, we gather to sing, to pray, to listen, to support and encourage one another. Let us worship God together.
Please be seated. We are called to walk humbly with God. And in that humility, we, we take a step back and we look at ourselves and our lives and our hearts and we know that there are places in which we have fallen short and so we confess our sins to God. Let us pray. God of mercy, of life, of light, of hope, we have fallen short. There's no other way to say it, God. We have failed you. We have wounded your children and in doing so have harmed your image in our siblings. We've abandoned those we love. We've not loved those whom we are called to love through careless words or indifference, through actions or deeds left undone. We have left your children hungry, thirsty, naked, stranger, imprisoned. Forgive us. Forgive us from your great mercy, from the depths of your heart. Hear our prayers. We open ourselves to you knowing that you are a God who loves infinitely, who forgives endlessly, and who provides grace unceasing. So we throw ourselves on that mercy, knowing that our love for you is dwarfed by your love for all of us. Amen. Friends, God's love is for you, for me, for the world. God's love brings new life, brings hope, and brings peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please share a sign of Christ's peace with your neighbor. Last Sunday, in the courtyard, we celebrated the sacrament of baptism with a family. Um, Jonathan uh, James Bridwell and his parents were there. Um, his parents joined the church about two years ago. Um, wonderful people, Emily and James. Emily is the niece of Susan Hanauer and the grand granddaughter of Sally Patty. Um, and we were honored to celebrate the sacrament of baptism with them last week. We did that in the courtyard in an effort to continue to be safe and cautious with all the, the virus things still going around. But we celebrate baptism together as a community. So we're acknowledging that baptism and in a sense celebrating it here today as well. We opened last Sunday in the courtyard as we opened any baptism with the words from Matthew 28, the Great Commission as it's often known, the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples that give us our mandate for baptism. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. With thankfulness for those words of Jesus, we ask people at baptism, ask parents to make vows on behalf of their young children. So I asked Emily and James last week the same questions that we asked them when they joined the church, questions that might be familiar around here for membership. We heard them last week with new members. We hear them with confirmation. We hear them at baptism. Questions about purpose and intent in the Christian life, turning from the ways of sin and turning to Jesus Christ and promising to be a faithful member of Christ's church. We sort of renew those vows every time we hear them and recommit ourselves to the journey, to walking the walk and living the life of faith. After the vows, I said a prayer over the baptismal font, asking that God would bless Jonathan and bless the water, um, that the water would be a sign of cleansing and rebirth and celebrating that Jesus came to offer us living water. And then came the baptism 
which we get to see thanks to video technology. Jonathan James Bridwell, child of God, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, <laughs> the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm told he likes bath time, so here we go. See what great love God should have for us, that we should be called children of God. That's exactly what we are. Thanks be to God. <laughs> He's got a smile and a laugh. <laughs> uh, friends, we now receive Jonathan in Christ Church here at Covenant Presbyterian. I charge you to nurture and love Jonathan and his family as they grow in the Christian life. Wherever you are, please join me in this affirmation. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into the church. We give thanks to you, for together we are the body of Christ, and we are all one in Christ. We promise to love, encourage, and support you, to share the good news of the gospel with you, to help you learn the word of God and the will of God, and to help you live as faithful Christians. things about that baptism. The family made it clear to me that Jonathan likes bath time, so I tried to use as much water as possible with that and seemed to enjoy it. And more importantly, you know, we're, we're in this together. We need one another. So we share that with you, not just to show you a, a delightful family and a delightful um, infant, but to remind one another that we're in this together, that we make promises for one another, that we try to encourage and support one another on the journey. So thank you for being here today to do that, and thank you in the days, weeks, and years ahead for the ways that each of us will be able to encourage and support one another on the journey of faith. We continue to do so welcoming people from um, YouTube land. We're glad all of you are worshiping with us. We're glad you're all here today. As we move towards our children's video for today, I do encourage you to find those black friendship pads. You can pass them down the row and say hello to whomever you might be sitting with today. If you're worshiping with us online, we're glad you're here. Feel free to contact the church office um, if you have questions. And um, if you're visiting with us for the very first time today, we hope you'll stop by the Welcome Center. I know a couple of you have already, and pick up a um, gift bag for first-time visitors. We're glad you're here, and you'll see that we love having kids around here, too. Hi, everybody. So today's Bible story talks about treasures. Well, I'm recording this video on a very rainy, kind of cold, kind of icky weather day. And one of the things that's really fun to do on an icky weather day is to watch a movie. Well, I was thinking about movies and icky weather and treasures and it made me think about a movie that was really popular when I was a kid. And I bet some of your parents or other adults, I bet many of you remember this movie too from when you were kids. The movie is called The Goonies. In this movie, the Goonies are a group of boys who are good friends. And they find a secret map that could lead them to a hidden treasure. The treasure they believe will have all kinds of gold and jewelry and all kinds of really um, expensive kind of things that could make them rich. In fact, the kids in the movie call the treasure the rich stuff. So they went off on an adventure looking for the rich stuff. 
I will tell you that they, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, they do find the treasure. Their adventures aren't over yet, but I won't spoil the whole movie for you. But you can, you can imagine there was a whole ship full of rich stuff, all kinds of gold, coins, and jewelry, all sorts of rich stuff. They were pretty excited to find it. Well, I'm thinking also about our Bible story for today. And do you know what? I have a treasure too. I do. You also have a treasure. In fact, all of the people that are around you at church also have a treasure. Well, what is that treasure? Is it rich stuff? Well, it's not rich stuff like the Goonies found, but it is pretty, pretty fantastic and rich. And that treasure is the knowledge that Jesus came to live among us here on earth and to teach us ways to be good people and ways to live a good life and to take care of each other and the right ways to do that. We know that and we can hold that treasure and it's in every one of us. So, hmm, unlike the treasure in the Goonies, this treasure, the treasure that we have, isn't supposed to stay hidden away. It isn't supposed to be secret. It's supposed to show through us. So what that means is that when we choose to follow Jesus's teaching, to live a good life, to care for others, to care for the earth, we are sharing our treasure with others. And that's just what Jesus wanted us to do. So I hope that you use your treasure this week to, to live a life that is full of good things and your treasure shines through you. Let's close with a prayer. Dear God, help us to recognize and use the treasure of Jesus to live lives that are full of goodness and grace towards others. Amen. Now, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great week. As we approach the gift of listening together for God's word in scripture. I do so today with the invitation that you would join me for some silence as you prepare your heart to hear what message the Spirit has for you prior to reading, and then I'll have some time of silence after reading. Thank you. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the consciousness of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, 
who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As Charlie mentioned, this congregation has been reflecting on the book The Walk by Adam Hamilton. If you're a visitor, or if you just didn't get a chance to read it, Today is the fifth sermon in the series, which has covered what Hamilton outlines as the five essential practices of the Christian life, worship, study, serving, giving, and today is sharing. Perhaps of all the topics addressed, Sharing our faith is the one about which most traditional Presbyterians might feel the least comfortable. Images of street corner evangelists or memories of uncomfortable questions about the state of our own personal salvation have left many of us apprehensive about sharing our faith. Speaking personally, I have been cornered by more than my fair share of evangelists, and every time I scratch my head and think, how can it be that we read the same Bible and worship the same God? And yet, I contend, there remains something to be learned as we lean into our resistance about how and why we might share our faith as we broaden the perspective about what we're called to do. Hamilton lays out a foundation for why sharing our faith is key to living a Christ-centered life. His approach is to break the process into steps or five things or actions to do. While my rebellious spirit, for better or for worse, I seem to bring to everything, resists being told what to do, particularly when it comes to my faith, I do appreciate the intentionality the author recommends. Indeed, he challenges us as readers to consider bringing the same intention and practice to our spiritual fitness that we do to our physical fitness. In doing so, he emphasizes that our purpose as followers of the living Christ is to center our lives not around our own self-interest, but rather around the burning, radical realization of God's spirit within us, within everything we encounter, and everyone we meet. With that foundation, I could not agree more. There are a couple of threads I would like to pull on concerning the spiritual practice of sharing our faith that, I, that have become more clear to me over the long years I've been in ministry. And as I listen to Paul's words from 2 Corinthians, the first is that we fall short of engaging with the topic of sharing our faith 
if we get stuck in the words we use. Hamilton gives a nod to this when he quotes St. Francis of Assisi's famous line, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. For years, and in several congregations, I've encouraged confirmands to write a personal statement of faith as the culmination of their year of confirmation classes. I've also led adult ed classes and new member classes in more than one retreat, probably, where I've practiced this type of exercise with people. While it's a good exercise in theory, time and again, it became a painful and upsetting assignment for individuals, whether they were teenagers or adults. You could almost just feel the anxiety build in the room around finding the right words to describe their faith and their beliefs, and even more dramatically, around the fear of using the wrong words. And even though I would try to break through that as a teacher, I'm not entirely convinced I ever did. The, the truth is, words can get in the way. Stating what we believe is a cognitive exercise. And if we think that our faith is a process that primarily engages our cerebellum, we've got the wrong organ in mind. Faith takes place and takes root in the heart. Faith involves an experience of unwarranted grace, or to repeat what I said a couple of minutes ago, turning to a radical realization of God's spirit within us and with everything we encounter and within everyone we meet. This emphasis was echoed in the words of Bishop John Shelby Spong, who recently died after a long and courageous life as a leader in the Episcopal Church, he wrote, I define myself above all other things as a believer. I am indeed a passionate believer. God is the ultimate reality in my life. I live in a constant and almost mystical awareness of the divine presence. I sometimes think of myself as one who breathes the very air of God, and to borrow an image from the East, as one who swims in the infinite depths of the sea of God, I am what I would call a God-intoxicated human being. Yet when I seek to put my understanding of this God into human words, my certainty all but disappears. Human words always contract and diminish my God awareness. They never expand it. I love his description of a God-intoxicated human being. What that offers us is a sense of purpose that goes beyond finding the right words. That frees us from that performance anxiety I would encounter so many times with confirmands and members and officers and in seminarians who were asked to place a statement of belief in front of us. Because, and this is the heart of what I think could free us to live generously and share our faith more generously, because it's not about us. Finding right or wrong words is a human construct. And faith is not shaped by our actions, by our doing, or by our achieving. In fact, the great irony of this whole topic is that if anything conveys faith, it's often in spite of us rather than because of anything we did or said. Whenever I realize that, I think of the story of a, a woman who, as I was leaving my first congregation in suburban New York, um, came up to me and I just assumed she was going to say all the wonderful things I had done during my time as a pastor. 
And she said, Nancy, you know, when I think of you and what gift you've brought this congregation, I think of one Sunday when you got up to do your benediction and your stole was all rumpled because I'd been playing with it. And I, I looked at her and thought, hmm. And I've carried that image with me throughout my ministry, that it's the, it's the rumpled stuff we do that sometimes carries a sense of permission to someone else. And the Bible is full of examples of people who stumble and fall, and yet God uses them. The, buller, the bulletin cover quotation touches upon this as Father Richard Rohr writes, in prayer we sit in our emptiness, doing something at which we cannot succeed, and let God's faithfulness, faithfulness be our only success. The passage from 2 Corinthians echoes this. No, the passage from 2 Corinthians blasts this message. In verse 5, it says, What we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness also makes that light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say that this is our treasure. This is our light. And this is our gift. And what is our role in all of this? Well, he rather unflatteringly reminds us, and dare I say himself, that we are clay pots. Clay, not that durable, not that impressive, not that important. We are vessels that contain a precious gift. Does this take away from the importance of practices to enhance our sharing? I'd say an emphatic no. This treasure deserves the best clay pot we can offer. And we live in a world where we're constantly pulled away from the treasure and the gift. The intention and attention it takes to live from our hearts and keep God at the center of our lives is necessary and helpful. Like Charlie said, we hold each other as a community that supports each other and finds our way on this path. James Finley, a teacher at the Living School, says that an intentional focus on our spiritual lives puts us in the place of least resistance to being overtaken by the loving presence of Christ within us. The place of least resistance. Because we know our resistance all too well, don't we? It is the centrifugal force of life that pulls us away from God's presence. The noise, the technology, the need to achieve, the desire for affirmation and praise, the search for status and affection, the pursuit of comfort, the fear for our own safety. It hurts and haunts us. In the face of these forces that take so much of our daily attention and energy, spiritual practices can provide a center, a structure, an anchor to stop the spinning. They provide opportunities when we're open to resting God's mercy and grace, where we can meet the love of Christ who offers to shine in us and through us, and where we can move out into the world and offer that light to others. There is the good news. There is the gospel living that Francis talks about. And it's offered in verse 4 to us that it comes to us through God's mercy. So we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. 
We engage in this through God's mercy and forgiveness and grace. And love is at the heart of what fuels our community, our worship, our study, our serving, our giving, and yes, the sharing of our faith. So when our words fail, and they will, and when we fail, and we will, that love will shine through us. I imagine that maybe more than a couple of us are here this morning because we hungry for that experience of gospel living, for what Paul describes in verse 8, that we might be afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We might be perplexed, but not driven to despair. We might be persecuted, but not forsaken. We might be struck down, but not destroyed. Because we have the love, the forgiveness, and the mercy of the living Christ within us. And maybe you've seen that light shining in someone, and maybe that's why you've been on a journey of faith in your life. Each one of us will discover our path to living fully into sharing that experience. Some of us will follow the five steps Hamilton outlines. Some of us will find other paths, and whatever the path, God will be with us. We will be with each other. You are not alone. And together, we'll find how to put ourselves in the place of least resistant to being overtaken by that extraordinary power Paul describes. I end with a story that I've heard taught in a number of faith traditions. This is the Christian version, based on a writing from M. Scott Peck's book, The Different Drum, Community Making and Peace. Once a great order, a decaying monastery had only five monks left. The order was dying. In the surrounding deep woods, there was a little hut that a rabbi from a nearby town used from time to time. The monks always knew when the rabbi was home because they saw the smoke coming from his fire rise above the treetops. As the abbot agonized over the imminent death of his order, it occurred to him to ask the rabbi who was admired for his wisdom and insight, if he could offer any advice that might save the monastery. The rabbi welcomed the abbot at his hut. When the abbot explained the monastery was in decline, the rabbi could only commiserate with him. I know how it is, he exclaimed. The spirit has gone out of the people. It's the same in my town. Almost no one comes to my synagogue anymore. So the abbot and the rabbi sat together discussing scriptures and their faith. And the time came when the abbot had to leave. It's been a wonderful visit, said the abbot. But I have failed in my purpose. Is there nothing you can tell me to help me save my dying order? The rabbi paused thoughtfully. The only thing I can tell you, said the rabbi, is that the Messiah is among you. When the abbot returned to the monastery, his fellow monks gathered around him and asked, what did the rabbi say? He couldn't help, the abbot answered. The only thing he did say as I was leaving was that the Messiah is among us, though I do not know what those words mean. Well, in the months that followed, the monks pondered this and wondered whether there was any possible significance to the rabbi's words. The Messiah is among us? Could he possibly have meant that the Messiah is one of us monks here at the monastery? If that's the case, which one is the Messiah? Do you suppose he meant the abbot? Yes, if he meant anyone, he probably meant Father Abbot. Certainly, he could not have meant Brother Eldridge. Eldridge gets crotchety at times. But 
Come to think of it, even so, Aldridge is virtually always right. Maybe the rabbi did mean Brother Aldridge. Of course the rabbi didn't mean me. He couldn't possibly have meant me. I'm just an ordinary person. Yet supposing he did, suppose I am the Messiah. And as they contemplated in this manner, the monks began to treat each other with extraordinary respect on the off chance that one of among them might be the Messiah. And in turn, each monk began to treat himself with extraordinary respect. And it so happened that people still occasionally came to the beautiful forest and monastery, and without even being conscious of it, visitors began to sense a powerful spiritual aura. They were sensing the extraordinary respect that now filled the monastery, hardly knowing why people began to come to the monastery frequently to picnic, to pray, to play. And they began to bring their friends, and their friends began to bring their friends. And then it happened some younger men came to visit the monastery and talk with the elder monks. And after a while, one asked if he could join. Then another and another asked if they could too join the abbot and the older monks. And within a few years, the monastery once again became a thriving order, a vibrant center of light and spirituality in the realm. May God bless us to be vessels, to be clay pots who hold and share this precious gift, this living Christ. May it be so. Amen. As we consider our offering, what we bring and what we bring to the table, we remember that this is also our time of generosity, our generosity season, in, in which we consider how our gifts may help to support the mission and ministry of this church. And in hearing what Nancy had to say, when our light is shining, the light that shines inside, the light that we build up, our inner light, it does not stay captive here, but it radiates. It spreads light in the darkness. It, it casts away the shadows. It brings light to the world. And so as we consider our offering, the ways in which we may live and give to serve God, we also recognize that anything we offer here or elsewhere shines the light of Christ just a little brighter in this world. Let us now offer of ourselves.
Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, Nancy. Our worship service continues as we pray together. There are copies of the prayer list on a table as you leave the sanctuary. You can also get one at the church office. You can contact us uh, by email or call or stop by. There are new, no new names on the prayer list this week, but it's a good time for us to pray for this church as we look forward to 2022. I'm grateful and nourished when people tell me they're praying for me and for other leaders in this church. I encourage you to pray for one another in this season. And maybe uh, we can take some encouragement from Adam Hamilton in his chapter on sharing. He talks about encouraging us to think about five people. He likes the number five, a lot of, a lot of fives in the book. And so maybe today's a good day for us to think about up to five people. Maybe it's just one or two, but maybe up to five people who might be having a hard time right now, people who might not have a church home, people who might not know the light and the love of God, people who might be blessed by a prayerfulness and a sense of encouragement from, from us. In that spirit, let us come together in prayer. Thank you, God, for the gift of today. Thank you for blue skies and sunshine for the gift of being alive. We lift up to you our prayers for ourselves, our church, and the world around us. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, the people of Haiti, the people anywhere who are struggling to survive and dealing with conditions that most of us can only imagine. We thank you for people who work sacrificially to make this world a better place. We pray for our nation, oh God, in this time of strife and challenge. We pray for our leaders, that you would help them to listen to one another and work together for the common good, to find solutions to the problems that face us. We pray as well, oh God, for our community, for our neighbors, for our neighborhoods, we pray for our schools, our police departments, our hospitals, and the people who work there, that you would bless them, keep them strong and safe, and help them to do what they do and do it well. We pray for our families and for our friends, for anyone who might be hurting, facing difficult medical issues, grieving the death of a loved one, struggling with addiction or isolation or loneliness. We pray for families and for relationships where there are challenges and bitterness and sadness. We pray for your healing, God, for your peace, for your blessings. And we pray for this church and for the church universal that as we walk forward on the journey that we would learn to live a God-intoxicated life, that you would show us how to preach the good news always with our words and especially with our deeds, with our choices, with our example, with our very lives. We thank you most of all, God, for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the one who calls us, the one who forgives us, the one who claims us, the one who leads us forward. In his name we pray. Amen.
Let us be a vessel for God's redeeming love. And as you go from here, may your light shine on those who most need it. And may you know the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.